Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our EVLOA 2 and VOP Town Hall. Before we get started, we're going to go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves. They, everyone here works for APFA, and they're busy answering your calls every day. I'm Julie Hedrick. I'm the National President of the APFA. To my left, I have Jeff Peterson, and he is filling in for the contract department. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Jeff. And I'm Marty McMillan. I'm the National Scheduling Chair, and I'm glad you could join us. Hi, I'm Kim Tech. I'm the National Retirement Specialist, and I'm going to be talking about the VIA. Hi, I'm Kathy Sharp. I'm the APFA National Health Chair. Hi, everyone. Josh Black, National Secretary. Glad to have you today. And we have a few more experts on the phone with us today also. We have David Arnett. He Hello. Is joining us and he will be, thanks, David. He'll be talking about unemployment. Go ahead, David. Sorry. Hello, my name is David Arnett. I'm a APFA contract and scheduling representative. Thank you. And we have Mark Littleton. I always forget to unmute. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, I'm Mark Littleton. I'm a Charlotte based flight attendant. And I serve as the assistant to APFA National President Julie Hendrick. Okay, and Patrick Hancock. Hey, Julie. Patrick Hancock. I'm a member of the executive committee at Hack Number Five, and I'm the National Retirement Specialist Emeritus and DFW based. Great. Thank you. And um, well, first off, uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us, and also thank you for everything that you have been doing for this last year. Either we know either you're an active flight attendant out there working every day or you may have taken a leave uh, to help make sure that our flight attendants are not furloughed. So we want to thank everyone for all your hard work, and especially we know this has been a really trying year. Uh, the reason we're here shows that. I mean, this is the third VIA that has been offered in less than a year. Uh, I, we are on multiple leave options, so uh, we thank you for number one, trying to keep up with everything on a regular basis, and also for helping out. Um, we know that this has been a difficult time and we appreciate everything you do. Um, the reason we're here today uh, for these options we, is to mitigate the furloughs. We, our flight attendants have 4,245 of our flight attendants have received WARN notices and those war notices are for them to be furloughed sometime in April. And that is if the PSP or the payroll support program is not extended. Now, most of you probably know that we are actively pursuing uh, the payroll support program being extended again. It actually is already in the stimulus bill. And this week, uh, it should be voted on in the House. So we're hopeful that if that will pass and that we will not have any furloughs if that is continued. Um, but as you know, we have to prepare in case that does not happen. Um, and we will be offering uh, leaves and VFs. And of course, if you take the leave and the PSP does pass, um, the leaves will still, you'll still be able to take the leave. And um, we probably will have somewhat of an overage uh, for a while until the demand is back um, and our flying is back to what it used to be. <coughs> so, um, first off, we are offering now three months, 12 months, and 18 months leave. They all begin on April 1st, 2021. All leaves are by bid month, so that not by the calendar month, they are by the bid month. So, if you bid for one of these leaves and are awarded it, the leave will start for everyone on April 1st. So if you bid for the three month leave, then that leave would take you all the way through June and you would be back to work July 2nd, 2021. If you were to bid for the 12 month leave, doesn't matter what leave you're currently on, um, you would be coming back March 31st, that would be the last day of your leave, 2022, March 31st, 2022. 
If you bid for the 18 month lease, that ends September 30th, 2022. Sorry, I forget to do that every time. <laughs> Josh, I can I can feel the look coming from you. Hi. Um, so unfortunately, it's the company calling right now. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that everybody really understands this is a conversion. This is not an extension of a leave you're currently on. This is a conversion, meaning everybody will start their new leave on April 1st and the end dates are those that I just talked about. So, um, to be eligible for this, you have to be an active flight attendant as of February 5th, 2021. So, uh, February 5th this month, you had to be active. That would include if you are out on salary continuance. So, if you're on an IOD and you're on salary continuance, that's if you're out on military, family leave, if you're out on a paid sick, that's also included, or of course, vacation. And then we have had a lot of questions from our recalled flight attendants wanting to know they're not back to work yet and wanting to know if they're considered active. You are definitely considered active and you can put in for these leaves, but you do have to be fingerprinted. So make sure you still continue that fingerprinting process even if you're putting into the leave and you get one. You still have to go through that process. Um, you are not considered active if you're not on one of those, like if you're on an IOD and you're no longer on salary continuance or being paid by sick time, if you're out on workman's cop, you're not considered active. So, um, and that's pretty much the same, Kim, right, for the VOPs. I mean, that the active status. That is the same for yeah. the VOPs. The determining date is uh, February 5th. So if you were active on February 5th, I've had a few people ask if they somehow have to call in sick after that, if, will it affect their ability to take the VAP? And no, it does not. As long as they're not on a attendance level such as preterm or if they're not violating any regulations. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so I know we've had a lot of questions and we have lots of questions about eligibility. So we're going to try and really make this clear for you because um, I think probably we had at least 20 questions about eligibility there, and most of them are flight attendants who are currently on a leave. So you want to make sure that you realize you can put in for this leave if you are out on a PVLOA, if you're out on an STLOA, and if you're currently, as of February 5th, on a 15 or 18 month EVLOA. So we signed a enhancement to the original letter of agreement that added in that if you are currently out on one of those 15 or 18 month EVLOAs, you're eligible to bid uh, for these leaves. So if you are out on an EVLOA and it is the 15 month, you're eligible to bid for the 12 month or the, the 18 month. And if you're currently out on an 18-month EVLOA, then you're eligible to bid for the 18-month uh, EVLOA too. So um, we have had quite a few questions on what leave am I on, um, and which is understandable. I don't think in my entire time of flying I've ever seen so many leave options and different names. Believe me, we all have a hard time keeping up with them too. Um, but the three leaves that really everyone is out on right now are the PVLOAs, the STLOAs, or the EVLOA. And we have a chart up on the screen for you today. Is that, um, can we project that, Josh? I looked at it and I thought it was already up there. There we go. And we put this out in a hotline, uh, I believe that was on uh, last week. It was on the 15th, so February 15th. If you're looking for it and you want to see it, it is in our hotline on February 15th. So you can look in Crew Portal. You can look in uh, FOSS on your HI-1. Uh, I think you can also look on your HI-10M, and you will see one of these codes. If it's a PVLOA, you're going to see the GL code. If it's an EVLOA, you'll see the F1, 2, or 3. Those are broken down by pay. And then the STLOA is the S1 or the ST. 
So if you are on any of those uh, leaves, you can put in for this leave. Okay. Now, I know we've gotten many questions on why isn't there a six month? Why is there a nine month? The 12 month and the 18 month are too long. You know, believe me, we try to negotiate with the company for shorter term leaves, uh, but the, they were only willing to add the three month leave in uh, right now. So um, we do hear you. We know that. Okay, sorry, technical problem, um, which is, we're always running into these days, right? But that's what happens when we're trying new things. So, okay, uh, negotiation. So we also tried to get sick and vacation, and we realized that, you know, that makes a big difference for everyone. We had hoped that we could get that. We, were, that we, we had that in the PVLOA, but we did not have that in the EVLOA, the last EVLOA. So unfortunately, we weren't able to get that. I don't see that changing um, at this point. So if you want to put in for these leaves, um, this is what it is going to be, the terms of it. Uh, if you're putting in for the leave, uh, the EVLOA, the deadline for that is March 6th at 2359. So it's different from the VOP, that uh, deadline is a different date, so make sure if you're putting in for the leave that you get your ballot in by March 6th. Uh, the PBS bidding process has been delayed for next month, and so you will be able to, when you, if you put in for the leave, when you go to look at your LRD, um, it will either not be there or it will say zero. Uh, and you'll know that you got the leave. These leaves, we won't see a list posted until about March 18th. So you will know individually if you receive the VAP or the leave, uh, but you, we will not be posting that information anywhere. Okay, so hopefully I made that clear enough. This is a conversion to a leave on April 1st. No extensions of leave, so everybody that puts in for these leaves, your new leave is going to start April 1st, and it's going to be for 3, 12, or 18 months, and that's it. So um, I know that that's going to have it. We've had a lot of confusion on that. So, um, okay, we're going to move on to um, our next specialist here who's going to help us. Oh, before we do that, Josh, let's go to the... Flight Service website. Okay. Okay, and I want to show, point out here, there is a lot of information uh, on the Flight Service website. Josh, if you can go over to the top right corner here and click on it, this is where our information for the VOP and the EVLOA2 is. You just want to click on it and scroll down, and you can show everyone. Here you'll find the letters of agreement. You'll find the um, questions that are frequently asked. Uh, oh, and they've also put on their town hall presentation. Um, and the ballot for both the VOP and the EVLOA too. So there's a lot of information there for you. So we just want to make sure you knew where to go to find more information um, if, in case you didn't get it here today. Kim. I just wanted to mention that some people are finding the ballot somewhat confusing. So the ballot shows the EVLOAs and the VOP options all together. And then it's not, I know, for the VOPs until you hit like stage seven in the ballot that you actually get to make your choice. Okay. So if you get on there and you find the ballot confusing, just keep going and eventually you'll be able to designate which choice you want okay. of the options. Okay. Right. Thank you, Kim. I know today with the EVLA, we're going to walk through the ballot choices um, so that they see it. Okay, so let's go to um, our first expert is going to be Mark Littleton is going to be discussing a few items today. Uh, Mark, are you, uh, do we have Mark up and ready to go? I'm here. 
All right, Mark, we're just making sure you're on the screen. So, Mark, the first question is, is why are only the 18 and 15 months EVLOA able to change to EVLOA 2? I would gladly change my, to shorten my EVLA and ask if this would be an option when we were recalled and was told no. I couldn't afford to quit my job and I got possibly a one month of flying and thought I had no other choice but to keep my original EVLA request. So this question is about why can't they shorten their leave um, and, and why it hasn't them been offered? Right, and, and we've heard this question from several flight attendants. Um, and it's important to remember the goal of the EVLOA 2, as Julie mentioned, is to mitigate the need for furloughs. Um, that is to get additional people to take leaves so that we don't have to go through the furlough process again. And allowing flight attendants to shorten their leaves that have already been awarded does not help reach that goal. Um, and the purpose of allowing only the flight attendants on the 15 and 18 month EVLOA to convert is because there were options that would actually extend their time on leave versus short net. Great, thanks Mark. And this one kind of goes along with that. Why are the people that took the 24 month leave excluded from the new EVLOA 2 option? Right, and again, because even the people who are eligible to participate they're on EVLOA, as Julie said, remember, they're not tagging on to their current EVLOA. They're abandoning that and starting an entirely new leave that will keep them out longer than they were originally scheduled to be out. There's no option available that would keep the 24 month leave participants out longer than they already are. Any option they converted to would have shortened their leave and as we just discussed with the previous question, that doesn't really help the company achieve the goal they're trying to achieve. Great, thanks Mark. Okay, let's move on to the pay um, for the EVLOAs. Um, we have a question here. Why is there such a disparity in the pay in these leaves? Um, and this flight attendant also would like to know, how to, can we discuss how the money from the payroll support program is used by the company and feels that everyone should be treated the same and why are we all not being paid the same amount? Oh wow, um, okay. So this is really complex and if I had a nice big whiteboard and a bunch of colored markers, I could really map it out for you. Um, but I'll try to explain it as simply as I can. Um, breaking it down, why is there a disparity in the pay of the leaves? The simple answer is the company really doesn't want the more junior flight attendants to take the leaves. Um, if they remain and do the flying, it reduces the cost of the operation or the cost of every block hour that the company is flying because the, the higher paid employees are off on leave getting a fixed reduced amount. So that's really why they want to incentivize the more senior flight attendants to take the leave um, and keep the lower paid flight attendants on the property to run the operation. Um, as far as the PSP funds, there, there seems to be great misconception about those monies and how they're used. And um, perhaps that's because we didn't do a good enough job of educating our members about it. But the PSP funds are not dedicated funds, dedicated to fund the leaves. They're not dedicated to fund the VOPs. It's payroll money. Um, it's one big pool of money that's given to the company to help cover the payroll costs and not just flight attendant payroll costs, but the payroll costs for every group in the company. Um, and so there seems to be, you know, some misconception that this is like a pool of bonus funds that is either should be divided up equally like a pie or that comes to the union and says, here, how do you want to divide this up? And that's really simply not how it works. It's just one big pool of funds that the company receives to help them cover all their payroll costs. Thanks, Mark. I think actually that's a really good idea for a hotline mm -hmm. that we should pretty much, ex we should explain how the money is used. And um, since we are going for our third round of hopefully um, funds to uh, for payroll. So thank you. Okay, Mark, um, you're not done yet. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we have a flight attendant here who is considering both options and wants to take the 18 month leave first, but uh, before she decides to retire. 
she said she's been a flight attendant for 13 years, but is at a nine year pay due to medical leave. Well, I receive only seven credits a month pay instead of 28. Uh, and so she's, she's asking if it, the pay is going by her occupational um, or classification seniority. So would you mind uh, answering that, please? No, I got it. Um, so under the terms of the, of the EVLOA 2, the number of hours you to receive will be based on your occupational seniority. So if your occupational seniority is 13 years or more, you would receive 26 hours and 15 minutes per month at your current rate of pay, which is determined by your longevity or classification seniority. Um, so the hours are determined by your occupational seniority. Your rate of pay is determined by your classification or longevity. Thanks, Mark. Okay, we're going to kind of move on to a little bit different of a subject, and this is priority of return. There has been conflicting information on the priority of return while on an EVLOA. Can you please clarify and explain why the company changed the rules? Can you also explain why they would see someone senior to them on the transfer list? Sure. Um, to be clear, the company has not really changed the rules. Unfortunately, the information they initially communicated regarding priority of return while on an EBLA was incorrect and not in compliance with the JCBA. Uh, the JCBA states that a flight attendant on an approved leave will remain in her his base unless displaced or furloughed. Um, so if you elect to take an EBLA, your transfer request and your priority of right of return would be placed in an inactive status. When you return from the EVLA, your transfer request and priority right of return will be reactivated. You don't forfeit your priority right of return by taking the EVLA. It just gets suspended until you come back. Um, as far as why you might see somebody on senior to you on the transfer list, even if you have a priority right of return, currently the transfer list appears strictly in seniority order with no indicator of who has a priority return on file. Um, however, when actually processed, the available vacancy transfers go first to, the, to those individuals holding a priority return and then to in seniority order to those flight attendants not holding the seniority order of return. Thanks, Mark. I know um, it's really important that um, I think everyone understands that we have followed the JCBA with the recall, with the priority of return, um, you know, there, this is a lot of language that some of it is the first time that it's been used. Some of it has a lot of past practice. And so um, every everything that we have done in the past uh, nine months, we have been working very hard to make sure we're either following past practice or if it was new language, the intent of how it was negotiated and what, what the intent was. So thanks for that, Mark. Um, all right, I have one more for you, Mark. Okay. Can you explain if the company decides to cancel leave, how that would work? Sure. Um, all the various leave programs that have been negotiated have a, let's call it a cancellation clause in it. Um, that says if they suddenly need more bodies back to work than they have, you know, that there's a, a provision that the leaves could be canceled. Before they can do that, the company must first meet with APFA and discuss what the need is, how great the need is, and how best to accomplish it. But all of the provisions are the same, that they will be offered, people on the leaves will be offered in seniority order a chance to return, and if not, then they would be assigned an inverse order of seniority. But again, before any of that can happen, the company has to meet with the union to determine what the situation is that's driving the need. Thank you, Mark. All right, we're gonna give you a break. Um, stay tuned though, there might have something later on. Okay, we're gonna move on. Again, we're staying with all EVLOA questions right now. So all of these um, questions and answers are about the EVLOA. And we're gonna move over to Marty, who is our scheduling chair. And she's going to help us out with a few uh, questions here. The first one, Marty, is about reserve. Um, and it's this is a flight attendant who would like to take the three-month leave 
and wants to know if reserve reaches her seniority, will being on this voluntary leave satisfy her reserve month? Unfortunately, no. That will not satisfy your reserve served uh, or while you're out on the three-month leave. And for everybody returning back from a leave, you're always subject to reserve your first month coming back as active flying uh, after a leave. You're always subject to reserve should your seniority require that. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to vacation. All right. <laughs> uh, 101 questions about vacation, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, we can either, do you want to just talk about vacation first, and then we'll see if we covered it on a lot of the questions, and if not, I'll ask you a few questions. But I know you've got a few items you'd probably like to cover on vacation, because I'm sure you're getting a few questions. We are. We are getting a lot of questions about vacation because the vacation bidding period is open right now. And so um, if you're on a leave right now or you're planning on taking a leave, should I bid for vacation? And the answer is absolutely yes. Now, if you don't want to go to a lot of trouble putting in a real strategic uh, bid for vacation because you know you're not even going to be active flying during that time, you can wait and they will assign you vacation. That, that's one option. Or you can bid to have your vacation if you know you're returning at some point uh, during this vacation cycle. You can go ahead and put a bid in for having your, to have your vacation be taken once you return. Um, if you're unsuccessful and you don't get those vacation days when you return back to active status, um, you can always participate in the vacation monthly rebid process as well and you can move some of your vacation over to when you would like to have it taken. So I just wanted to cover a couple of terms too that I think you need kind of a refresher on uh, for vacation bidding, because when you open up your vacation bidding screen, it's been a year, uh, you're gonna see accrued days. And those are the days that you have accrued last year. So during the 2020-2021 uh, year, these are the days you accrue for vacation. You might also see some carry forward uh, days on your vacation screen. And those are days that um, were carried forward because you didn't take the vacation and you didn't get paid for any of them. So they carried them over. And those are going to be bid in the secondary round of vacation bidding. And then a one that always is confusing are filler days. And filler days are a part of your accrued days, but those are days that you can choose to not have scheduled as vacation and then elect to schedule them at some point later. If for some reason you don't schedule those days, then those are going to get paid out and they are paid out in June. Uh, for this year, they'll be paid out in June of 2020 on the mid-month paycheck. 2021. Oh, 2021, yes. Sorry. No, 2022. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the current filler so like No. The next year, the, right. next the ones are yeah. bidding next time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So those will be paid at the end of that vacation year. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. you have to wait and see. Did you use those filler days? If you didn't use filler days, then they're going to pay in June. Um, so we talked about the rebid process. Uh, vacation buyback has come up a few times too. The vacation buyback for this vacation cycle has already occurred. It's been awarded. They were awarded the contractual minimum, which is 5.5% according to the JCBA. Um, we won't even talk about that. Uh, but those, uh, that vacation buyback, uh, that's going to be paid out on the mid-month paycheck in June of 2023. Okay. Is that right? Two. Yeah. Two. Hard to extract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Far out. Uh, if you are on an EVL away, if you choose to take the EVL away, you will not be able to participate in next year's vacation buyback. So that's something to be aware of to help you make your decision. Um, if you have vacation days that you uh, have scheduled for next year and you're not going to be here because you're taking the EVL away, what will happen is you'll see those vacation days awarded to you, and then two months prior to when those vacation days are going to occur, they will remove them from your schedule. They're not lost. Don't freak out. They are not lost. They just go into your unscheduled days to be bid on in the next cycle of vacation bidding. So you just kind of want to keep track of 
how many days you had that you were awarded and then what's going to happen to those vacation days. If you come back to work, you can still, you can ask to have those vacation days put back. For instance, on a rare occasion that they might think about canceling these uh, leaves, they would put your vacation back on the days that you were awarded that. Um, I think I mentioned, but just want to reiterate one more time, you can participate in vacation monthly rebid during the time of your leave. So you can move your days around to whenever you would like them to be. Uh, there's also an excellent guide for those of you who have been on multiple leaves during the course of the last year. There's an excellent guide on the ACFA website and it's called, uh, basically I think it's called the Guide to How Vacation Works When You're on a Leave. <laughs> <laughs> massive document. It's 27 pages long. Don't let that intimidate you. Flip through each page and look for the situation that fits your, your situation. Okay, what leave you're on and when you're going to be returning to work. And that guy will exactly explain to you what happens to all your vacation in case you get confused. Um, that's been a problem. A lot of people have not have lost track of how many leaves they've been on and how many vacation days. So you can also always email the company. It's sa.vacations, plural, at aa.com. And they can tell you what's happened to your vacation, how many days you've accrued, how many days you've got to bid, and that sort of thing. They know exactly what you've got. Marty, will the count of your vacation days, however many you have, let's say you've been out there and will they always be able to see this in the ABBA system? Um, or, or for this year, they can see right now. But the carryover, they should be able to see too. I'm, I'm, I'm questioning because I'm not sure. Right. So what they have told us is that you, I have seen them show up. However, they will not populate when you go to put your ballot in. The only ones you'll be able to currently bid on are your accrued days in the primary round because that's what's yeah. open now. Once the secondary round opens, any days that you didn't get awarded from your accrued days uh, during the primary round and any carry forward days, you would be able to bid in the secondary round. So if you, if you see them on your main screen, but then you go to put your ballot in and you no longer see the carry forward days, it's just that they will be only allowed to be bid on in the secondary round, so they'll populate that. Okay, that, that's pretty good. I think you've covered most everything. Did you cover why are they even bidding their vacation if they know they're not going to be here? Well, because we don't know what's going to happen, as we have seen <laughs> over the last year, year and a half. We don't know what's going to happen next. So, you know, the great thing I think would be if we saw the industry make a fantastic recovery sooner than expected and they canceled some of the leaves or you were given the option to come back right. earlier, you want to have your vacation um, scheduled so you know what you're coming back to. Thank you. Um, okay, I know we also got a question about if in the secondary bidding, more vacation days would be added in. And in the secondary bidding, um, it, it it's just basically whatever is left from the primary right. will be in the secondary. So the primary will have the one big bucket of vacation days, and whatever is not bid in the primary will go into the secondary. Correct. They don't add more days, yeah. Okay, here is the question. How many days will we be able to rebid at a time when we return to work? I don't think there's a limit to rebidding. You there can put in as many ballots as you want for monthly rebid. So, you, you know, it's just, it's just a strategy that you want to use. And, yeah, there's no limit. We have a lot of flight attempts with a lot of vacation days right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you've covered most of these buyback you covered. So if they have buyback already, if they already were awarded it, they're going to get that money. Mm -hmm. um, and they, if they're out on a leave during the next one, they cannot uh, participate. Right. Um, just quickly going through these to see if there's anything we missed here. Um, I told them how to do it. Okay. I think we've covered that. I, I did want to mention one thing. The uh, guide that I was talking about, the really massively long document, I think it's 29 pages. Um, that one is a little bit hard to find, and I will get with Josh um, and our uh, our IT folks and see if we can get it put in a more easily to find location. But if you are looking for it, if you just go on the search bar on the main page of the APFA website and type in vacation 
space lead. It'll come right up and that'll be the first document to populate. So just click on it and it'll take you right to the doc. Maybe we can send out a hotline and link that, right? And the other vacation guide, the PowerPoint that you just did. Yeah. And um, basically walking everyone through how, how to bid. Okay. That would be great. Let's get that out. I'll add that to our list here today. Um, okay, Marty, you're not quite done yet. This one might be a little shorter for you, but I know we've got a lot of flight attendants who want to know if they take the EVLA, what happens with their CQ training? Do they have to attend? So if you're on an EVLA, you do not have to attend. We would like to say you would want to attend um, at some point during your EVLA. You don't have to go in your base month. You don't have to go in your grace month. What you do have to do is you have to bid and tell them that you want to go to training. So if they're not going to assign you, like, you know, if you're on the line and you don't bid during your base month, they're going to assign you training. Um, and if for whatever reason you miss it, they're going to assign you in a grace month. But while you're on the CBL away, they're not going to assign it. So the only way they're going to know you want to get training done is if you bid for it. And does that apply to the three months also? No. Three months people have to go to train. Okay. Okay. Right. And some things just to keep in mind about training if you would like not to go while you're on the EVL away, especially folks who've been on other leads up to this point, have been out for a while, know when the last time you went to training was. It's very important that you know the month you went and month and year you went to training the last time. If you go into your 37th month since you last went to CQ, you're going to have to go to training for three weeks. You don't want to do that. Okay? Don't do that. That's really so important. If you go 35, 34, that's okay. You're still going to just get, you know, the regular CQ. You will have to do additional modules for anybody that's gone QI uh, during this time. You will do additional modules. Um, there's one, I think, that's called while you were away that you have to do if you go more than a year from your training. And then any modules that everybody else has been doing all along this process, you're going to do those modules as well. So set aside a couple of days to get through all that. There you go. Okay. All right, Marty. Thank you very much for all that information. Uh, let's see. Next up, we are going to, Jeff is going to walk us through bidding for a, an EVLOA. So we're going to go to the ballot and um, here it is on the flight service web page and it's where we told you it was earlier. Okay, Jeff, it's, it's all yours. Yes, as Kim said earlier, when you go to the ballot, either the VEOP or the EVLOA ballot, that is, there are a lot of steps before you get to even make your choice. So you'll, it's multi, multi steps here. First step, your name. First name, last name, your six-digit employee number, and you're going to want to give a personal email address because you can elect at the bottom to have a receipt of your entry uh, of your submission emailed to you. So that would be important because we have found that if you don't, if you want to make sure that you submitted it correctly and if you have the receipt, you can prove if something comes up that you actually have uh, proof that you submitted your electronic ballot. This is a very good addition to the ballot, to say the least. <laughs> This is something APFA requested. Uh, we definitely need this because we need people to have receipt of their ballot. Um, we just had something happen. You weren't here, but it, it definitely is really a good addition. So they, let Josh, let's walk through so we can get to the next screen. So right? step five, we're going to go to uh, apply for. So in this case, Josh is applying for an EVLOA. So he's going to click on that circle there, and he's going to click next. And so this is, you're acknowledging, on this page, you're going to read the details of the EVLOA, and you're going to need to acknowledge that you accept and understand what you're doing. <laughs> uh, so you'll click on, I, I have read through and understand the program details. Step seven is where you actually get to start bidding for the leagues or, or that you want. So you have the option to rank them by choice one, two, and three. So let's say he wants to take a 12 month, his first choice is a 12-month leave, his second choice is an 18-month leave, and his third choice is the three-month leave. We now, in this round of EVLO, we actually have the option to select not desired. So if Josh only wanted the 12-month leave, he does not want to bid for the three-month or the 18-month. He could simply say not desired to three-month and 18-month. 
So that gives us a little more flexibility in how long. And you have to do that, right? Yeah, yeah you have to close out unless you do that. That's correct. You have to make an election on each of the uh, the options there. Step eight just is an, an acknowledgement that you understand the the pay um, related that we've already gone over that Julie went over earlier. And then you're going to want to still get your receipt email receipt of your responses. So you have your we always want receipts. And I'm not going to let Josh hit submit because <laughs> that would be a, that would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been doing this this morning, practicing. <laughs> it gave me a heart palpitation to even put my name on one of these. <laughs> so make sure you hit the submit uh, button. That is for sure. You have to hit that in order to uh, bid for one of these things. Make sure you do that. Kim. But once you put in for it, you can resend it. Yes. As long as the options haven't closed. Yes. yes, and that's actually a very good point. If you, if for some reason you change your time between now and March 6th, or if Josh were to inadvertently press submit, you could go back around to the beginning of the form and put in, the, you know, electing system. Then. And it's March 6th for the EVLOAs, and it's the February 26th for the VOPS, which is this coming Friday at midnight Central Time. Coming soon. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thanks, Josh. Um, Jeff, before I let you go, one more thing. Let's talk about the travel benefits on the EVLOA. Well, the good news is there are really no changes to your travel benefits when you go on a leave. Um, you will be able to travel non-rev just like you do today at the same priority. Um, you will be able to ride the jump seat. As long as you, as long as your ID badge is current, you can ride the jump seat. And uh, other airline travel is also uh, going to be uh, as it is today, as if you were um, flying and active. The only difference, I think, for people who are non revving um, going forward, be while you're on a leave, you would lose your KCM access. So that would really be kind of the only change to how you might be non revving. You'd have to go through normal security. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple questions about health benefits uh, for the leave, and Kathy Sharp's going to answer a couple of these for us. So, uh, this first question, Kathy, is we want to know if we keep the same health benefits um, and can you do CQ in our base month of taking? We already covered the CQ, so don't worry about that. Let's just talk about health benefits if you go out on a leave. Right. So um, your health benefits are going to remain the same as you have now. You're considered active. You're going to have the active benefits. You'll be able to do, make, um, do benefit enrollments each year. So that, that, is, that is the good thing. It's all the same. Prices are the same. Coverage is the same. Perfect. And then the next question, I believe this is about the FSA balance. Um, can you still use it? You can still use FSA and your transportation FSA. Um, unfortunately, you can't cash them out, but you still have access. Okay, David, um, let's see here. Uh, I need unemployment insurance to take this leave. What should I do? Thanks, Julie. Um, so I think the one thing that we want to tell our claimants this time around, especially employment benefits. So every state is going to look at the eligibility and the administrative criteria and then assess good calls for your prospective participation. So since unemployment benefits aren't guaranteed, I just want to reiterate that because you take the leave, you are not automatically entitled to receiving unemployment. So please think long and hard before you click through the ballot they were just showing us. Um, and be sure that even if you did apply, it could I know, um, do you want to talk to them about all the information that we have on the website and where to find that? Um, because yeah. you and Kelly have worked a, a, a lot on unemployment and there's a lot of really good information there for them. Absolutely, Julie. So um, we have recently updated the website. Um, if you're having problems with your claim, you're not able to get through to the state, we have put a link to um, a blurb that you can write to your state representatives and the link that we have on the website only works for the 11 if you have an address in the 11 base states 
That way you can send messages to your senators and Congress people. We also have legal resources. So most for the states broken down by the topics that we've seen the most uh, claimants have issues with. Great, thank you, David. I know there's been a lot of work, um, not that's just gone into the website, but all the work you've been helping the flight attendants with over the past nine months with unemployment. So um, let's see, we have one more question for you, David, and then we'll move on to VOPS here soon. Um, I've been Another year. How does that work with unemployment insurance and will I keep receiving until I come back? That's a great question because we have a lot of people that it will be coming up if they do take a second EVLOA too, they, they'll come up on the year mark. So each state again is going to determine your eligibility. Your initial claim is good for 52 weeks from the day that you first filed. And once that claim has exhausted, then you can reapply for an additional 52 weeks. However, please keep in mind that you may, may not have earned enough to qualify if you've been on a consistent leave of absence for the past, you know, during the base period, because it's gonna take a new base period into consideration um, for your eligibility. And the state benefits that you're currently receiving right now may not be, if even if you are approved, what you would get in the future. So. That would be up to the individual state. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay, one last question here on leaves, and this is from a flight attendant um, who has received a war notice. She says she's on a PVLOA now, and what happens if I do not take any more leaves? Will I be furloughed quicker than someone who took a leave, or will I go back to flying immediately? So, as far as if you are going to be furloughed, you'll be furloughed. Furloughs are in seniority order. And so taking a leave doesn't stop you from getting furloughed. It doesn't help you at all um, from getting furloughed. So I would say you have to make the decision based on your life today. And um, as far as if you're going to be furloughed or not, or not, it will depend upon your seniority, not whether or not you took a leave. And let's hope that PSP um, continues and we won't have to worry about furloughs. Okay, let's move on to the VOP. I think the EVLA took a little bit longer than what I had, we had planned, um, but I think we can get through this and we may end up going a little bit longer um, than, than uh, the one hour. Okay, so we talked about the timeline for the VOP and um, let's, the VOP deadline is this Friday, February 26th at 23.59. So if you're thinking about taking it, um, please make sure you get your ballot in by that time. We know this is a personal decision for you. No one can make it for you. We are here just to help you um, with any questions you have. But we know everybody's um, own you know, decision is based on their life. So um, we're just here to help you in any way we possibly can. So we have Tim Tuck with us who is our retirement specialist. And um, Tim, first if you wanna just quickly go through the overall VOP options and eligibility, um, and then we'll get into some of the questions. Okay, so once again, I guess you can't reiterate this too much. Um, you had to be active and eligible as of February 5th, 2021, and that means on payroll somehow, basically, or the one exception to that is family leave, and there may be a few exceptions if you were QI, like you cleared from a medical leave or an injury on duty prior to on or before February 5th, if you're able to get training scheduled, they may determine that you're eligible to take the VIA. Um, that's based on the chart provided by flight service. So um, anyway, um, and February 26th is not an eligibility date. If you were in that little QI group and you were able to clear any time after the 5th, but before the 26th, you're not technically eligible, unfortunately, you know, and we're not in agreement with the company on the whole, you have to be active thing. We think it should be offered to all the flight attendants on the seniority list. And we have pushed for that, but that's not what they've chosen to do. So, 
We keep trying. Yes, we do. And so just make sure you check your eligibility, and then if you are eligible, then put in prior to February 26th at midnight or 11.59 Central Time. Um, in terms of general questions, a lot of people looking at the VOP this go round. You know, it's not our first rodeo with these, and the options are basically the same as the last two rounds. So there's the option A, where you stay on payroll for 12 months, and then you retire. And with this round, April 1st would be the date of beginning your VOP, no matter which option you choose. If you choose option A and you stay on payroll for 12 months, you would retire on April 1st of 2022. During the 12 months on payroll, your benefits would be active employee benefits. You would have active travel benefits and uh, you would not be able to fly because you're basically kind of on a paid severance leave for that 12 months. The company would require you to send back all your company issued uh, property um, at the beginning of the 12 month period. And in order to fly in the jump seat, they're gonna send you a special, what they call a jump seat ID. And it's basically your retiree ID early. And it says you're eligible to ride on the jump seat through April 1st of 2022. And there's information about all the property that you'll have to send back and kind of, you know, what you do in order to get it back to flight service. You don't have to take it there in person. They have links to FedEx that you can send that back on. And um, that's all on the flight service website. So um, the other option for the VOP, option B is the lump sum VOP. So that option you would retire on April 1st of 2021, which is pretty close. So um, you would receive a lump sum payout equivalent to what 456 hours it's the exact same amount that the people who elect a 12-month VOP would be getting but that's just spread out over 12 months at 38 hours a month right. so the money is the same either way you may be taxed slightly differently if you take the lump sum because you can you know you're gonna it could bump you into a higher tax bracket so but again that's your personal choice in general, what I am seeing is that the people who are taking the lump sum are those people who still have a decent pension and they're not eligible to double dip as some of the former U.S. Airways flight attendants are. If they're LUS or LAA and they're not yet double dipping age and they want to start their pension right away, those are the people pretty much who are taking the lump sum option. If you're not yet eligible to start your pension or you are already double dipping age and you can get your pension, and this is applicable only to the U.S. Airways folks that have PBGC pensions or former TWA or Eastern. Those people are staying on payroll, getting their pension, and if they're also eligible for Social Security, getting Social Security. So most of those folks are taking the 12 month on payroll option. Um, generally speaking, you know, everybody has a different scenario. Um, as far as benefits, I'm getting a lot of questions about how the benefits work for each option. And each option is, uh, if you take either option, you're going to be eligible for 30 months of active rate benefits. However, that can mean different things for different people. And I'm getting a lot of questions about how does COBRA enter into it. Um, if I get 30 months of active rate benefits, why are they mentioning COBRA? No matter which option you choose, COBRA is going to enter the picture at some point. So if you take the 12 month on payroll, the op option A, um, you would have the first 12 months be active employee benefits because you're basically on the paid leave and you haven't retired yet. Once the first 12 months ends, you would be offered an additional 18 months of COBRA. So there's the 30 months and the first 12 months is active benefits. The additional 18 months is technically COBRA. And this is because when you retire, the company is legally obligated to offer you COBRA. With the uh, lump sum VOP, if you retire on April 1st of this year, you're automatically gonna be offered COBRA 
And so you're going to be offered 12 months of what they call active rate COBRA. So COBRA with the um, 12 month option is also active rate COBRA. And that means that instead of like normal COBRA, where they would charge you the full cost of your benefits, they've tried to incentivize people to take the VAP. So they've discounted the COBRA cost to match what we pay as active employees. So it's a very good incentive. And then with both of the VAPs, um, if you also qualify for the 65 point plan, which is your age plus your years of service equals 65 or more, you're eligible for the RHRA, which is the Retiree Health Reimbursement Account or arrangement. And Patrick Hancock is going to talk a little bit about that, um, but I just kind of wanted to mention the eligibility for that is a slightly different criteria. There won't be many, but there may be a few people that are eligible for the VAP, but not eligible for the 65 point plan. So, um, so I have one more thing that's different. That's the relief. Oh, yes. Okay. So in the past, everybody who's taken the VAP has had to sign what's called a release of claims letter. And it's a legal document that the companies, you know, produced in order to, you know, they think protect them, I guess. I don't know really the reasoning for it. Um, but they're making everybody sign it if they want the benefits of the VAP. And it's been pretty consistent. And similar letters have gone along with early outs in the past. So it may look a little bit different, but similar things have existed whenever there was an early out package. Um, the difference uh, on this go around with the release of claims letter is that um, it gives you a little wiggle room in terms of maybe if you change your mind or something, because uh, everybody has to re Sign the release of claims letter if you're putting in for the VAP by March 20, March 22nd of 2021. However, in most states, they're going to give you another week, um, you know, to change your mind. And before on the previous VAPs, that was not the case. So, um, so March 22nd is the date you have to get the letter in by, and then once you once you signed it or send it in, you have a week to change your mind. If you haven't changed your mind after that point, it's irrevocable. And also this time they're saying, if you don't ever send the letter in, they're gonna say, okay, you're back on the line and it will negate the whole putting in for the VOP. Okay, so they have to sign the letter. They have to sign the letter if they wanna keep the VOP. There's no, if you don't sign the letter, you don't get the benefits of the VOP. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kim. Okay, um, Kim, I've got a couple questions for you, and then I'm going to move over to Patrick with the RHRA. I think next one for one K questions. Um, Kim, I have uh, how, when, and where do we apply for our pension? Okay, so not all flight attendants have a pension, but if you have a pension, um, it, it's going to depend on whether you're. LAA and your pension is with State Street Bank, who is the trustee for the legacy AA pensions, or if you're former U.S. Airways, Eastern TWA, and you have a PBGC pension. So either way, if you're LUS or LAA or former TWA, you can access your pension information by calling the um, Employee Service Center at AA. That's 1-800-447-2000. Um, you would hit option one for active employees. In the next menu, you would hit option three for pension and retirement questions. And then in the third menu, if you have a PBGC pension, you hit option three, and they'll direct you to the PBGC. If you're an LAA person, you would hit option four. And so that's where you'd go to request your pension paperwork and everything. You could also call the PBDC directly, and I've got the number somewhere around here. Is that, is, are all those numbers in the packet that the company um, has on? I think they are all in yes. the packet that the company has on the page there. So, yes. Right, and they're in the APFA retirement packet as well. Okay. But the PBDC number is 1-800-400-7242. Okay, so you got it on there. You can find those, inf those numbers if you haven't written them down. Uh, in the APFA 
retirement packet as well as uh, the VOUT packet that's online. Okay, great. Okay, um, let's see here. You already covered COBRA, so, uh, and those are active rates. I, we have a couple questions here about COBRA, but it, it looks like they're pretty much asking um, why is COBRA mentioned, and you covered that in what you just explained, but once you get past that 12 months, you're going to go on to the COBRA, but it's still at the active rate. Right. And also, I think I saw a question about um, does COBRA mean it's different coverage? And COBRA is not different coverage. It's a different word, but that word is basically describing a continuation of your current coverage. So COBRA is a continuation of what you currently have. So if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield and you're in a certain state where that's the administrator, you'll continue with your Blue Cross Blue Shield coverage if you elect COBRA. If you have UHC as the administrator in your state, you'll continue with UHC. The only thing that would change that is if you change your address, um, you update your address in the benefits section of JetNet. And they do go by your alternate address for some reason. So if you have an alternate address in JetNet, that's what they go by. If you only have one address, that's what they go by. Okay. All right, thanks, Kim. And here's a question about will children that now qualify for health care also be able to use the benefits offered in the VIA health benefits? Yes, they will. Whether it's the COBRA benefits, you know, it, if you continue your own benefits um, through the VIA, you know, you'll be able to continue your spouse's and your children's benefits. If you go to Medicare, they're still going to offer, and, and your spouse and your children aren't yet Medicare eligible, they're still going to offer the COBRA benefits to your dependents at the time that you retire. So, okay. okay. And what about my husband is currently on my insurance plan. However, he is over 65. So under COBRA administration, he'll need to transfer to Medicare as primary insurance. She wants to know, will we receive instructions or packet for transition? Okay, there has been no packet historically from what the company's done. Um, so the thing about COBRA is that there's a law that says, well, basically, if you are eligible for COBRA and you're also eligible for Medicare because of your age or due to a previous disability, that Medicare is always primary and COBRA is always secondary. So if you come up on the COBRA, even though you're technically eligible for your, you know, 30 months of active rate benefits, if you're also eligible for Medicare, it doesn't really make sense in most cases for you to keep those benefits. Um, most people keep the dental and the vision, but for medical, they go on Medicare. And um, one of the big reasons for that is that COBRA is not considered creditable coverage. So if you were to try and go on the COBRA, number one, um, it would pay as though you have Medicare, whether you've signed up for it or not. And number two, you could be penalized later on when you do sign up for Medicare because COBRA is not considered to be creditable coverage for Medicare. So um, the company's not gonna send a packet out um, in the past, they did send out, there's this form that's called uh, the CMS L6, I mean 564. It's a Medicare form, and basically it's uh, kind of a notice of employment verification that you had health coverage while you were working for the company. And you send that form into the company and they mail it back to you, and then you take it along with your Medicare Part B application when you're signing up for Medicare. And that prevents you from being penalized for a late enrollment because you're showing that you had good coverage through your company. So it's a, I would suggest that you get the form and it's available through the um, www.medicare.gov website. I can, I can, I'd be happy to email it to you. I think it's probably somewhere on JetNet if you can find it. So um, it's a good idea to go ahead and proactively get that form and send it into the company, especially if you're going to take, if you're considering the lump sum um, VOP and you're going to retire on April 1st and you're already eligible for Medicare, you want to get going on that as quickly as possible and make your decisions about Medicare. Um, okay. Thank you.
Thanks, Kim. All right, I'm going to give you a little break. You may come back to you. And I'm going to go move over to Patrick now. We have a couple questions on 401k. We have Patrick on the screen. Yep. Okay. You do. Right. Hi, Patrick. Hey. Okay. Uh, I am 51. I wish I was 51. I will not attain the age of 55. If I take uh, a VIA, will I be able to access my 401k at 55, or will it go? Or will it go to 59 and a half? All right. Um, oh. Thank you. That you are eligible to take money out of your 401k when you leave, but the when you retire from your employer. But the problem is there are two taxes. You will always pay an income tax on your traditional 401k. You will not on any 401k Roth, and you will pay a penalty if you draw it out before age 59 and a half, with a couple of of exceptions. Number one, uh, there are some hardship uh, withdrawals that if you document that we're able to waive the 10% penalty. Um, but there's also a uh, special uh, uh, enrollment, uh, a, separate, a set plan, which allows you to take payments out over a course of five years without paying the penalty if you're not yet 59 and a half. But that is just filled with risks. And so definitely recommend you talk to a financial advisor and fidelity before you do that. Um, if you are not going to make it to the age of 55 because you're terminally ill, then uh, you'll want to be thinking about, are you just trying to make sure you have enough money uh, now? Or are you trying to protect the 401k monies for your heirs? And because the answer will be different on those. Talk to a financial planner. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, another 401k question. If taking the payout over a year in a paycheck, which means the 12 month option, can you apply it to your 401k? Also, if taking the lump sum, can you also put that in your 401k? Okay, this is one of the differences between the 12 month and the lump sum option. When you take the 12 months, you're getting 12 more months of wages at 35 hours. And of course, you can uh, choose what percentage of that to put into your 401k. You get the company match, you get the uh, your, your contribution, uh, co the company contribution as well. If, however, you take it as a lump sum, that is not wages, that is severance. And the IRS says severance payments cannot be put into your 401k. So that's one of the differences. Okay, great. Okay, Patrick, we've got um, some RHRA questions, and we've kind of, uh, we're gonna, there's quite a few of them. Let's so, do a lightning round. I'll, you ask real quick, and I'll answer real quick. How's that? Okay, that sounds good. All right, eligibility. Okay, you, your spouse, and your dependent children. The short answer is, if the people are eligible for your uh, AA Medical as an active employee, then they would be eligible to use the RHRA funds. Okay, uh, if I die. There's no if, we will all die. But if you die before the money's <laughs> all up, um, your spouse gets to continue to use that money until they die or it's all used up. However, your dependent children are not eligible to use it after you die. And still eligible after 65. Yes, and that's one of the confusing things because at 65, you, you go to Medicare, but you still have this RHRA account out there to pay for not only your Medicare uh, deductibles, your Medicare co-pays and co-insurance, also your Medicare premiums. And uh, there are four parts of classic Medicare, part A, part B, part D, and SUP. The last three, you have to pay premiums. You can pay those premiums out of your RHRA account. Perfect. When can I start using it? When you retire. So if you take the uh, lump sum, that will be April 1st, 2021. If you take the 12 month, you'll retire on April 1st, 2022. And at that point, you can begin to use the RHRA accounts. Okay. Um, do I have to use it right now or can I wait and start it later? You can start it later. The company would like you to wait until long after you missed most of the opportunity to use it. That way they get to keep that, but you can wait and start it at any time. And what is covered? Ah, good question. 
there's an awful lot of things covered. And the simple answer is anything that is a uh, IRS approved deductible medical expense on your uh, income tax is approved. Uh, there's a partial list of covered expenses on the Benefit Service Center. Okay, and can I get just a one page list? <laughs> no, that, that partial list on the Benefit Service Center runs 19 pages, and I think it's way too short. Um, that if, if you're a geek like me and really want to get down into it, uh, the list is uh, in federal law, the IRS uh, 26 USC uh, sub 213. Uh, I've checked and my facelift isn't covered, but uh, you know, you want to check and see what is. <laughs> Darn it. I wish I could get that. Yeah, I know. Um, OK, if my spouse can cover me under their plan, can I still use the RHRA? Yes, you can use it for your deductibles, your co-pays, and maybe for their premiums. If it is a pre-tax premium, for instance, as active employees, we pay for our health care insurance pre-tax, then you can't use the RHRA for it because you already got the tax benefit. If it's a post-tax, uh, and there are a lot of environments, gig workers and so on, will frequently pay for their medical insurance post-tax. You can use the RHRA to reimburse post-tax premiums. Okay, if my spouse works for AA, can I still use it for our medical expenses? Yes, but like I just said, AA, we pay for our medical insurance premiums pre-tax, so you can't use Okay, and can it be used to pay for non-traditional or alternative health care? Such Maybe. as acupuncture, thermal imaging. Yeah, and that and that's a maybe, and that's when you need to go and do some of the digging on uh, the IRS uh, list of approved medical expenses. If the IRS approves it as a deductible medical expense, you can get an RHRA reimbursement. Okay, and can I use it out of the country if I move somewhere else? Well, most likely your FSA card is not going to work out of the country, but if it is an otherwise approved medical expense, you pay it out of pocket, submit the appropriate receipts, and you'll get reimbursed. Do I have to pay taxes on the reimbursement? Actually, no, this is kind of like the, uh, the FSA, the HSA, the HRA card. There's no taxes, um, but if you get reimbursed, you didn't have an out-of-pocket expense, so you can't then double dip and take it as a dedu tax deduction at the same time. Okay, we're almost there. You're doing great. <laughs> Are the RHRA funds being deposited in a protected account somewhere to make them safe from bankruptcy? No. This is a promise by American Airlines to pay your claims as you submit them. That, like any other promise that American Airlines has made, can be canceled in bankruptcy. Okay, and can AA just cancel the benefits at any time? No, it is a, a contract and therefore uh, AA has to honor that contract or be liable for failure to honor it, unless it's in a bankruptcy, which is designed to cancel contracts. Okay. And could someone buy AA and cancel the benefit? No, unless it's in the context of a bankruptcy in which they can cancel contracts. Okay. Last question. Were retiree medical benefits canceled in prior bankruptcy? Um, since you're not specific about one of the several bankruptcies, yes and no. Um, depending on which bankruptcy you're talking about, which group you were in, either active or already retired. Um, so it's it depends on, on how the bankruptcy goes and how the claims in bankruptcy are dealt with by the court. Okay, thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. Very helpful. I think, I think we can put all of those out in the hotline. That would be great. Um, okay, we've got a, I know we're way over you guys. Let's try and get a few more questions in and We've got um, a couple more for Kathy Sharp, who's our health chair, and then also I want to get the unemployment in too. So um, let me look at these and make sure we haven't covered them already. Good. Good. 
Okay. So uh, for those of us retiring and too young to qualify for Medica Medicare, how much does the Affordable Health Care Act coverage cost? Um, the affordable health care options vary from state to state and obviously with plan options. You can access plans in your state by Googling www.healthcare.gov. Um, that's going to be your best resource to find out what's available in your area. Okay, great. Thanks, Kathy. And let's see here. That one's on in the wrong category. Okay, does the 30 months of medical, dental, and vision coverage at active rates mean it will be the same premium coverage plans, rates as of now, including prescription medications that are needed? Can we stay with our same doctor, specialist, is hospitalization included if needed, and do short and long-term disability carryover? I'll get Okay, that one. I may defer to Kathy on the disability, but okay. as far as the active rate benefits for 30 months, it's the exact same coverage that you have now. So during this year, 2021, your rates are going to stay the same. In 2022, if you're on the 12 month VOP option or on even on COBRA, your rates could increase like they do every year for the active employees, but you will be paying the same rates for those 30 months that the active employees at AA are paying. So um, you'll be paying whatever the active employees are paying. And obviously, since COBRA is just a continuation of your current coverage, you can keep your same doctors, specialists, and so on. Okay. And um, I'm going to defer to Kathy on the disability question. Well, let's just, because I have another question on disability. There are two of them. So there. maybe you can kind of just yeah, answer absolutely. both of them. So the question here is, does the long and short term disabilities carry over? And then the other one was, if I'm on the 38 hour leave. So if you're taking the lump sum, if you and your benefits will end that the April 1 unless you have an active open claim with short-term or long-term disability, those will continue to pay the benefits. If you're on the 12 months um, and you end up filing a claim, it, it's an offset. And I, and I know it's like it's actually going to be a somewhat of a wash. There's a minimum for long-term disability. But let's say at the end of the year, you're still sick. I mean, I personally would keep the long-term disability just in case something were to happen a year from now because you would still get the benefits of what the plan allows. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, a couple more questions and then we'll be ending this. So um, can we get David Arnett back on? Okay, David, we have a couple questions for the VOP um, and this is for unemployment. What are the advantages of taking the lump sum versus the non-lump sum? Will I qualify for unemployment? Thanks, Julie. So from an unemployment standpoint, honestly, um, it's going to depend on the state in which you claim it versus lump sum versus non lump sum. In some states, severance pay, those earnings may disqualify, either reduce or not affect your benefit in any way if you are approved. And we've even seen where a claimant had received unemployment benefits for some time and then the state deemed them ineligible, triggering repayment of benefits received. And I just want to make um, one point very clear um, on the previous question. I just want to, if you are if you are currently on an EVLOA and you're going to think about balloting for EVLOA two, um, and you have a current claim, your current claim once again is valid for 52 weeks from date of filing. So it likely would not trigger uh, the company to reach out to uh, the state to reach out to the company to do a status update. Thank you, David. Okay, and then one more for you, David. If I chose to take the lump sum choice of VF, can I get my pension in Texas unemployment? And if taking the 38 hours per month, am I eligible for Texas unemployment? Well, the eligibility would be based on, you know, if they earn enough to qualify and meet the criteria, uh, Texas will determine your eligibility. And 38 hours is considered severance pay, and the Texas statutes provide that severance pay is a result of a collective bargaining agreement. It does not measure against the weekly benefit amount. Any pension that's received from an entity that is not from your base period employer does not measure against your uh, weekly benefits either. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, we have a question, and this is uh, for Kim. Thanks. Thank you, David, for those answers. 
Um, would it be possible uh, at the end for you to, is it, well, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me get this clear. Um, will AA be sending out a retirement to-do list? They will post a list okay. and with all the VAP information, um, they will not be mailing anything out. And then there also is a general retirement checklist that they have on JetNet. Um, we, we will also be posting some checklists for people who take the various VAP options. So the main three big things to think about when you're getting ready to retire and again, if you're taking the 12 month option, you won't be retiring for 12 months. So this is more for the people who already took the 12 month option last May and are gonna retire on May 1st, or the people that are taking the lump sum option and are gonna retire on April 1st. And the three big things to think about, number one, if you have a pension, you need to request the pension paperwork as soon as possible. And for both the PBGC and AA, you need to request your pension paperwork before March 15th if you want to have an April 1st benefit commencement date. Now, you won't probably with either the PBGC or with AA get paid your pension, your first pension check on April 1st. I know with AA, it's taking what we've been told is 12 to 15 weeks before you get your first pension payment. But if you get the paperwork done, I mean requested, before March 15th, they will retro pay. So you'll get paid for April, May, June, even if you don't get your pension until sometime in June, you'll be retro paid for all these months. Um, same with the PBGC. So um, that's number one. Number two is if you're Medicare eligible and you're retiring on April 1st or May 1st, if you took the 12 month option last year, then you need to go ahead and set up um, if you're Medicare eligible, get Medicare set up. So that's an important thing for anyone who's Medicare eligible and is getting ready to retire. And that form I mentioned, the employment verification form that's available on ssa.gov, you need to go ahead and request that as soon as possible, get it faxed into AA, they'll mail it back to you and then you take that when you're signing up for Medicare. Um, the third thing, which in a normal retirement you have to do, which is a separate thing, is to um, notify the company. But in this situation, you're notifying the company by putting in for the VAP. So and don't that's, forget to sign the release. Right, and don't forget to sign the release <laughs> if, if you want your VAP to go through. So, um, so that's pretty much it. Those are the big three. Obviously, there's financial planning elements, as Patrick mentioned, so it's always a good idea to talk to financial advisor, um, you know, Fidelity, your Medicare advisor. There's lots of people out there. Um, the company has a group called VIA Benefits, VIA. Their information is on JetNet and on the my.aa.com website if you need assistance with finding Medicare plans. Um, I have a couple of other names that other flight attendants have used. If anyone wants to contact me for that information, I'll be happy to share it. Tim, is the information on the website, on our website? Um, our retirement packet is very informative and it has all that information and there's good information on JetNet as well. So download the packet. You'll probably mm -hmm. find a lot packet. of what she's talking about in there today. A lot of the um, places they could go from. And then I had one other that I missed, and it's somebody who's getting married in June, and congratulations to your getting married in June, that's great. Um, do I have to get married before April 1st if I'm gonna take the VAP so, my, so I can add my husband to my insurance? And the answer is no, because as long as you elect the benefits, you know, so if you take the 12 month option, you're gonna be on active benefits, you can do a life event and add your spouse in June. If you take the lump sum option, um, you elect COBRA for yourself, then even if you're on COBRA, you can do a life event and add your spouse to your COBRA coverage. So either way, you don't have to change your wedding date. <laughs> Perfect, thank goodness. All right, well, thank you, Kim. I know we've gone about a half hour over, um, but there is a lot of information. I think we received prior to the call today, 150 questions approximately, and I know we have more questions coming in. 150 on the call. And 150 <laughs> on the call. So um, 
we'll have to see if there's, you know, if we should possibly do another one, look at all those questions and try and make sure that we're getting all the information to you that we possibly can to help you make this really important decision. Um, but we want to thank you for joining us today. I hope this was helpful to you. Thank you to everyone here at APSA, all our specialists, and especially those also on the phone uh, for answering questions. And um, we're here to answer your questions. You can reach us at APSA, at retirement, at health, at scheduling, at contract, um, to answer any questions that we possibly can for you. So thank you very much, and uh, fly safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.